got her uh, the vocabulary back. You haven't quite got that back yet, but uh, Brian shared with me that's usually the last thing that comes back. But she's expected to make a full recovery, so that's good. That was a shocker when he told me about that. Any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. Boy, we got about the next, in, in, not too long from now, we got a chance to save this nation. Start saving it. Amen. Yes. Yeah. My cousin Pam, she's fighting cancer, but she's, she's doing okay. And if my best friend Melody, she's, her body keeps swelling, her throat keeps closing on her, Ooh. and they're not sure what it is yet. There's not much they can do until she gets up. She's got pneumonia, too. Mm -hmm. So they, there's not a whole lot that they can do. So they're just doing what they can right now. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Unspoken. Unspoken. There's a lot in that. Anybody else? All right, let's go before the Lord. Father God, we love you so, so very much. Father, you heard these prayer requests, Father God, from cancer. Lord, I, I kneel before you, Father God, and I stand before you, and, and Father God, just uh, uh, for the world, Lord, that I'm a, uh, just a walking testimony to you, Father God, because in 2016, when I was diagnosed with my brain cancer, Father God, after they had done all the treatment and it had left, that you would, uh, had ridded it, uh, Father God, take, getting it under control through modern medicine, the miracle of modern medicine. Father God, when it came back, the next time it was all you. Father, you you just ridded my, my mind of that cancer, and I've been cancer-free since. So, Father God, I know that you're still in the miracle business. I'm a testimony of that. So, Father, I'm asking you to step in. These, this uh, Penny mentioned cancer. Father God, you would step in and heal them in the same powerful and miraculous and that way that you did me. And Father, made both of these instances just bring glory to your name. Father, you heard the other prayer requests. Father, Barry prayed for our nation. Father, we, we sure enough do need prayer for our nation. Father, we need you to, uh, Father, just to, to bring us back where America is great again. Father God, once again, under your tutelage. Father, just uh, one nation under under you. And Father, just uh, I can't help but think about there may be somebody in here that's lost here today. Father, maybe they're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Father, they just they don't know what's missing. They just know something is missing in their life. Well, Father, I pray by the end of this service that those who are lost have that emptiness that they would cry out to your son and they would ask him to forgive them and, and uh, Father God, and that they would receive his salvation this day. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Alrighty then, kids can be dismissed. The title of today's message, guys, is Essential Encouragement. Essential Encouragement. You know, there are only two possible consequences to knowing the gospel. When a person knows the truth of the gospel, he either goes the way and believes, goes and believes, or he turns back to his sin, just falls back into that, that rut, you know. But here in uh, today's passage, and by the way, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. But in, in, this, uh, in our scriptures today, Hebrews, they're talking about, what they're speaking about is the, 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 the first man that, uh, that actually hears the truth of the gospel responds to it in a positive way and accepts Christ into his heart. A positive response always results in salvation. And there are three things at part here today as, as, uh, as we're going to read through here. And that is that, uh, as Apostle Paul said in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, the three hallmarks of salvation is faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. And that's what we're going to be talking about somewhat here today, too. Two little underlying deals. The, the way the scripture is laid out today, if you'll just look at it, 
I'm going to point it. It's actually an outline in itself. An outline in itself. It, uh, it starts out in verse uh, 19 and, and 20. is the layout for the sermon, if you will. Verse 21 is the common phrase used prior to each point. It begins in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, and what I'd always tell you guys, if you see a, a passage of Scripture that begins with the word therefore, you need to look and see what the therefore is there for, right? Amen? In this case, what the, uh, it's referring to the first uh, 18 verses of chapter 10 where it describes and, and sits, uh, talks about the, uh, that Christ is the perfect sacrifice once and for all. There's no need for uh, the, the temple sacrifices. What was going on with these folks is the, because the, the book of Hebrews is written to the new, the new Jewish Christians. And they were having a hard time. They were uh, letting go of the, of the temple worship and the, and the sacrifices and just the, just things of that. The, the Old Testament, they were trying, having a hard time with that. So he's writing them. So the next word it says, brethren, brothers, that's what he's talking about when he speaks to them. He's speaking primarily, primarily to them. So, therefore, brothers, since we, have, uh, when he, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the, the curtain that is his body, Then he goes on to the next point. He goes to set up. He's going with that. And he says, and since, verse 21, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, point number one, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. Let's, let's finish reading it. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and, full, and, a, and a full, with, in full assurance of faith, in faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from, from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The primary basis in, by which we can draw near to God was because of what Christ did on the cross for us. He spoke of, in verse 20, he spoke of the, the temple curtain. Well, our mind should be, and I'm sure the, Jew, the Jewish Christians there, their mind was in the temple at that point because he just got through talking about it. And since we have the, uh, because of what Christ did, that we can draw near to God. Think about it. Before we accepted Christ, we could not draw near to God. We were separated from God. In fact, in that temple, he spoke about the holy place, that we can go there with confidence. We can go into the holy place. He's speaking of the holy of holies. That's what he's referring to. And in that holy of holies, that's the place where God's presence was. Not like in heaven, but like here on earth. It, was a, it, was a, it, it, it represented God's presence, a place where his presence was. And... There was a, when it said curtain, in other places it said the temple veil. Veil was something you can actually see through. You, like a woman wears a veil, you can see lips, you can see a, a nose through there. You can't quite make it out, but you can see it. That's not what it's speaking of here. That curtain is not a veil. That thing is huge. It's been said that that thing's about that thick. About that thick. It's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of just, I mean, thick drapery. This hanging down. It's so heavy that I don't know what the height of the temple is. I don't remember. It's described in the Bible. But uh, the curtain was held up there by this huge Lebanon tree log. That's what it was held up by. And the only person that could go in there was the high priest. And then only once a year when he took the, the sins of the uh, the, all the lambs that were slain, he, he took those into the, uh, the Day of Atonement to, to, for forgiveness for the, for the people. But other than that, we were separated. That, that curtain represented separation from God. We were separated from Him. And because of what Christ did on the cross, that temple veil was rent from top to bottom. In fact, when He was hanging on the cross, 
When he uttered those last words, it is finished, the, the, the Bible says that the earth, I mean, all around them turned to this darkest night, just a cloud of rolled in like that. It was darkened. The sun was blotted out. And then the earth quaked beneath his feet. And the temple veil, that thick, massive curtain, was rent from top to bottom. Now that's the physical aspect of that. That was just the uh, representing, that rep that's a representation. But I've often wondered, I don't know if you have, I often wondered why did Jesus have to be splogged like he was? I've often wondered that. Why couldn't he have just been uh, crucified? That would pay for our sins. But why was he so brutally treated that he was the cat of nine tails, who was, I mean, he was just ripped of ribbons. Because the true temple veil being rent, being torn, and, and, and us having access to that holy place was done by those Roman soldiers when they were ripping his, his, uh, his back and his front with that cat of nine tails. It represents that temple veil being ripped to shreds. Amen. And it's because of that that we can draw near to God. Amen. Amen. Once before we were separated, we couldn't get to God. But now we can because of what Christ did for us. It is by His blood, and that curtain is His body, just like it says. So, we can draw near to God. Because we have a high priest in the house of God. And because we have a high priest in the house of God, number two, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We profess. Look at verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. So the first positive response to the, to the gospel message is, verse 22, was faith. The second, here in verse 23, the second uh, positive response to the gospel is hope. A person who is genuinely hopeful will hold fast. And that word, hold unswervingly, that's what it represents, is hold fast. Hold fast. So, a person with genuine hope holds fast. And one who lets go doesn't hold fast. He has a lost hope. But the one who still has hope will still hold on. And holding on, holding fast, it doesn't keep us saved. You know, sometimes we think that if we just hold on, then we can just stay saved. But that doesn't keep us saved any more than good work saves us. But both, both are a hallmark. I mean, they're a, 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 they're a result of being saved. Amen? We were, they will be exhibited in Christians. You know, many people who have confessed Christ continue to many uh, uh, in their lives as though they really don't believe it. Like he hasn't really. They don't believe that he has uh, and put their faith in him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the confession of our life should line up with the confession of our lips. Uh, John MacArthur, speaking about this very, very subject, he, he told, uh, he, he spoke of a man that uh, didn't name him, said he was a successful businessman, that it, uh, he, had, he exhibited these three principles, faith, put his faith in Christ, his hope, that he put in Christ, and because of the love of God, he received grace. So he had accepted Christ. But then this man went on to open a pornographic uh, nightclub bar. So you ask the question, is he saved? You know, we, we don't know that. I will say this. I think all of us, because all sin is, the, is equal in the sight of God, right? 
That's what the Bible says. So who are we to judge of somebody like that? Uh, I think that if, because there is a, a, a time when we accept Christ into our hearts, then the Holy Spirit begins to work on us to get rid of the old man and replace that with the new man, which is Christ. And this man is no different than anybody else. That's just a bigger thing he's got to get rid of. Amen? The Holy Spirit is the one that does that, not us. But that man's, the confession of his life did not line up with the confession of his lips. See what I'm saying? So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. So the first thing we do is we have faith in Christ. We put our faith in Christ. And, and that even is from God. It's a gift from God. God gives us a measure of faith in order to believe in Him. And then He does. And then our hope is in the faith of Christ. In His faith. Amen? Our hope is in Him. So, first we have hope. Then we have, I mean, first we have faith. And then we have hope in Christ. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Number three, let us, uh, let, us, let us consider how we may spur one another on. It said, verse 24 says, and, and let us consider how we may spur it on. This is exactly what the point is. It's like it's, I told you guys, it's laid out just like a sermon time. I mean, sermon outline. That we, that, uh, that we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So the first positive response was of the gospel, was uh, hearing the gospel of the gospel, is faith. And the second is hope. And the third response, which is the greatest, is love. As Paul said in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, thir uh, Chapter 13, verse 13, the closing of the chapter. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The love he's mentioned here is, a, is actually a fellowship love. The Jewish believers, they were having, like I said, they were having a hard time letting go of, the, of the, uh, all of the, the rituals, you know, the... Uh, all the feasts and things like that, the, the sense of the temple sacrifices especially, and uh, this temple worship the way it was. They were having a hard time letting that go. So, the writer of Hebrews the writer of Hebrews used this to uh, to tell them that the way you get to the to it, that the writer of Hebrews is telling them that the best way to hold on, to hold fast, to break away from that is to spend time with fellow believers. To worship with fellow believers. See, because God, if you think about it, the old the Old Testament, the temple worship People weren't really involved in that that much. You'd bring the blood sacrifice. You'd bring the sacrifice to the priest. Then he would uh, sprinkle you with a little bit of the blood, and, and you pretty much went on your business. The priest did it all. Well, in this case, in the new church, we're invested. We're involved in worship. Amen? So he's having a hard time with that, these, these Jewish believers. So he was telling them, this writer of Hebrews was telling them, that the way to hold on was through sharing with, uh, with fellow believers. Because it's with the fellow believers that they could uh, uh, love and be loved. And so that they could, be served, they could be served and serve. Amen? Serve and be served. 
There's no better place to come all the way to faith in Christ or to hope continually in Him than the church, His body. Amen. And with that in mind, takes us to the last point. Since we have a high priest in the house of God, number four, let us not give up meeting together. Verse 25. And these really should be read together. And, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you why just in a minute. You know, because most of us, when we read that, this verse 25 by itself, let us not give up the meeting together as some are in the, co in the habit or in the custom of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as the day approaches. The day approaches here. Uh, I think with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the readers here and the time that Hebrews was written in between 64 and 70 A.D., I think that there was a looming understanding probably of uh, the temple, but the temple being destroyed pretty soon because Titus destroyed the temple in uh, 70 A.D. And after that, there was no more animal sacrifice because there was no temple to do it. Amen. So that ended. But for us, my Bible, he says right here, the, uh, the day approach, as we see the day approaching, day is capitalized, meaning that it is a significant time. And it's referring to when Christ comes back for his church. As we find those days. So that really, that, that pertains to us in this time. Amen? So the writers, uh, and it's not just about the, he the Hebrew Christians, but not us as Christians as in this time as well. <clears throat> God, it's very hard to encourage one another through social media. Those you're watching on YouTube or, or Facebook. It's so hard to to love each other and encourage each other over media. It's so important for us to be in a church environment with each other. Christ said that uh, that where two or more gathered, I'm there. He brings us with the Holy Spirit, brings the Holy Spirit. See, it's in the church where the Holy Spirit is on fire. We cannot feel that if we're not here with each other. You know, I miss uh, worshiping in, in, uh, in the dirt. Because back then on the winter months, in the winter when it gets really cold, I could build a fire right out there in the, in the arena. And there's something about that. I mean, who don't like a good fire, a campfire? There's something about it. You, you know what I'm talking about? The smell of that, that wood burning? Mm -hmm. Who would just smell so good? See, I think of it like this. The fire, all of the coals down in there, that represents individual us. When we come together in the church, we're a big old fire. Holy Spirit's moving through us. In fact, the Holy Spirit is not just in us, He's with us at that point. Anyway, what I would do, at least once a year, I would have a pair of tongs and I would reach in and grab one of those coals from the wood there, burning there, and I would blow on and show you how glowing it was. And I would set that coal aside on a rock, one of the rocks, or uh, away from the fire. And by the end of the sermon, I would pick that thing back up and show everybody that it's almost completely out. The only way to get that charcoal going back in is to put it back in the fire. Amen? God, let me ask you something. If, it, if this coal, if it's just watching the fire, can it get energized back into a no. rolling fire? No. No. No, we can't. To watch this church, if you're able to watch, uh, to, to be in this church, you need to be in the church. Because that's where we are encouraged by each other. That's where we get back on fire. I want to make y'all call. <laughs> anyway, then I put the, the charcoal back in there and it would get back to this glowing again, once again. And that's the way we are. 
guys. We can't. I mean, how many of us have had uh, relatives like sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, you know, close family members that would move off to another part of the country? You know, we miss them, don't we? You know, sure, we have our, we catch up with telephone calls. And I love the, uh, what we have now. I mean, you can do a, a, a Zoom, almost a Zoom call. You just pull up there and you can see the interaction of, of actually just seeing someone as you speak. But that's not the same, is it? I mean, we go out of our way to save enough money to, to buy airline tickets to, to get to be where they're at. And what is the first thing that we do when we see a loved one that's, uh, that lives so far away? What's the first thing that we do? You embrace them, don't you? And you get started getting caught up. There's something about just the physical touch, just the being in the presence of the ones that we love. And when we do it, you know, there's a, a, a survey that uh, that uh, did a, it was a survey about who is, the, what generation is the most, uh, the most depressed, lonely, the most lonely. And would you believe that it is the generation of today? I mean, we are more plugged in than we ever have been to the world, right? With these little laptops we're carrying around in our pockets. Yeah. But yet, that's the most lonely generation. And that's why you're watching things instead of being a part of things. There's something about just being in the presence of one another, that fellowship, that love and fellowship that we get encouraged by. Amen? The essential encouragement that we so desperately seek in our, in our soul and our spirit in the deepest part of us can only be found and accomplished in person. Amen? So I'm urging you, if you're watching on Facebook and and uh, your health is to the point because that's great if you not, not can't be at church, then that's the next best thing. I understand that. But if there, there's any way you need to be in church, if it's not here, then somewhere. But be a part of the body of Christ somewhere and get the, the encouragement and the love that you need in order to get through the week. Guys, uh, I'm going to speak another word of encouragement with you here today. I mean, you look around, you see boxes packed and, and uh, fewer chairs right here, just kind of getting everything down to the, to the bare minimum before we have to exit this place for the final time, which I've got to tell you is probably going to be the last service that we'll have is probably next week. Next week. Uh, found out that... Uh, See, Dallas County Capital Church doesn't want to buy our building, and they need to be in it uh, quicker because he, they're at the mercy of the, person, the people who bought their building. So they need, they need to be in our building quicker. So we're going to have to get out a little bit quicker. They've offered to pay for movers for us to, to take everything we're packing and put it into the pods, all the chairs and all that kind of thing. So it makes it a lot easier. We can leave. Don't have to worry about throwing stuff away or clean it up or anything like that. They'll take care of all of that. But my point to all of this is this. This is not a time for discouragement. It's a time of encouragement. We need to look at this in a positive way that God is, is yeah, He may be closing this chapter, but He's got a whole new chapter opening for us. It's a new great adventure that He's taking us on. That's the way to look at this. Amen? So, the 13th, we will be having our first service with the, at the Kauf Van Association. By the way, this is Ernie Mikulski. He's the, he's the head guy over there, and this is his wife. And I'm sorry, I forgot your Kathy. Kathy. This is his wife, Kathy. They've, uh, uh, they're here today to, uh, to worship with us. Guys, we uh, will have our first service there and, uh, and on the 13th. I'm, was it 13? 13. Yeah, I'm sorry. 13. So, guys, let me tell you something. 
I love this building. I love because we got so much history here. So much history. Some of the best times that I can remember at this church is when we were setting up in that arena. It was so enduring. I mean, we had to set up chairs every Sunday. A couple hundred of them. Run a sound system out into the arena. When we were first started out, it was on plywood, just laying out on the ground, wasn't it, Brian? Remember that? Those were endearing times. I look back at them, this fond memories. I look back at those times. Uh, we moved up from the, to a cotton trailer. You know, we was able to load stuff in that, and we'd have to handle all of our sound equipment twice. Have to take it out of the room, put it on the trailer, bring it around, set it out, put it back on the trailer, take it back around, and set it back up again. Sometimes in just a little bitty closet. I don't know how we did it sometimes, but we did. And then we graduated, we built a, a band trailer, made it a whole lot easier. But it's never been as easy as it is in here. We just walk up on the stage, plug in, and go. But there's so much about this church that, uh, and, and our experiences here that I'm going to miss. But I'm taking it with me, and you're taking it with you. We're not closing. We're not dissolving our church. We're just, take, we're just moving to a different location. Amen? This is a building. When you take it down to its to the to the, the uh, to its bare knuckles, God, get right to the end. The truth is, this is a building. The church is us. The church is moving, which is us. And that means that campfire, this this fire, is moving to another location. But we're still going to be on fire for Christ. Amen. In order to be one of those coals, you got to be in the family. You got to be in the body, because it speaks of the body of Christ. To be in the body of Christ, then you have to experience what I'm talking about here today. You first have to have faith in in Christ. In other words, what is faith? You put your trust in something. You've got to put your trust in Christ. And then he'll give you the hope that is backed up by his faith. And it's because God loved you so much that he gave his son that you can be saved. I'm going to give you an opportunity because I never close a service without giving some people an opportunity to ask Christ into their hearts. And as uh, Brian and Robert come up, I'll share you this with you. you. You guys have heard this so many times, you probably know it by heart. The way God came to me, the way I came to know God, I came to, to accept Christ into my heart, is back in 1983, I couldn't turn to the right or the left. Somebody was always talking about, did you know that the salvation work is actually God? It's not us. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. In fact, Christ said that no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. I remember God drawing me. I remember experiencing every, every aspect, every seed that was spoken of in, in Matthew chapter 13. The seed that was sown out there and, and the devil came by, uh, uh, birds came and, and ate it all up real quick. I didn't even notice those seeds when they came on me because I wasn't interested. And I can remember when those seeds were, uh, I, well, I started listening a little bit. And they would come in and I thought, well, I'm saved. No, I ain't. Because, uh, you know, the, the cares of the world come and, and, and it just choke everything down and, and take away that seed. But then God really, really started working on me, conditioning the soul of my heart to receive his seed of salvation. And that's when I couldn't turn to the right or the left without somebody talking about God to me. I just couldn't. Because let me tell you something, God is relentless. If he gets after you, he's going to chase you until you catch him. And that's what happened to me. I promised my wife before we got married that I would go to church. I would take us to church as the head of our household. Of the household. It's my job to do that as men. 
take our families to church. And I honored that after our kids were born, had both of them already born. Our, our youngest was, uh, was still a baby, and I remember going to church. And I've seen, I've been to other churches, and I know there's going to be an invitation at the end. And it's an old Southern uh, Gospel, Southern uh, Baptist Church. Hellfire and Brimstone Church. Old scarred up preacher named Ted Hicks. Thunderous voice. And I knew that there was going to be an invitation. I would made up my mind, there's no way that I'm going to get up and come forward in this church. So I was sinking deeper and deeper into that pew as the, as, as the time drew closer and closer. See, I was shy. I wasn't going to put a, I want to be a spectacle in front of everybody. I know it's hard to believe that I was shy like that, but I was. And I remember sinking down into that, into that pew. But then when that preacher, with that, um, just that, the, his content, countenance, the way he presented himself, when he said come, it was like the Holy Spirit himself was telling me, God himself telling me, come. And I got up out of that pew and I ran up there as quick as I could. I didn't run, but I walked very fast mm -hmm. and got down on my knees at the at the at the uh, at the altar, so to speak, and I gave my life to the Lord. I don't know how He's been working on you, if you are lost, but it's going to be in some kind of a fashion like that. Has He been after you? Have you been able to turn to the right or the left without somebody talking about God to you? Now, this very moment, if you're watching on you, Facebook or YouTube, this is the time for you. As I said, Christ said that no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. So I'm going to say a simple prayer. And if you feel that draw, pray the prayer of salvation right after that with me, if you would. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father God, at this moment, Lord, I... Father, only you know who you've been working on. Father God, I know you were relentless, that you sought me and you bought me. Father God, I'm just asking in the same way you drew me to your son, I'm asking at this very moment, those you've been working on, that you would draw them to your son at this very moment. If you felt that draw, just say this prayer with me, if you will. First thing you have to do is just admit, Lord, I'm, I know I'm a sinner. And right now, Lord, I turn from that sinful life. I agree, Lord, that you are right, that I am wrong. I want to do things your way. So, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart now. I receive you by faith into my spirit. I believe you died on that cross for my sins you rose back to life. You're living in me now. I recognize you as my God, my Lord, and my friend. And from this moment forward, I will serve only you. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. I said that prayer for the first time. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, and I need to talk to you about it. So here in the church, see me right after we close. YouTube and Facebook, my number's right there. You can click on that blue blue bar on the Facebook page or just go on our uh, Raptor J. Cowboy Church website and bring up my telephone number there as well. Uh, like I said, most important decision you'll ever make in your life, and there is a what next that I need to talk to you about. All right, we're going to pray out one last time. And stick around because we're going to have us a meal. What Baptist church wouldn't have a good meal <laughs> sometime, right? And, and by the way, uh, Ernie and, and, and Kathy, we want to serve you first, so be sure and get in the line first as visitors. We have another place we have to get. You got to go right after, you ain't going to get the eat with us? Oh, man. All right. Well, let's pray out. Father God, we love you so, so very much. Father God, just, uh, Father, I'm asking you to prepare our hearts, Lord, as we uh, say goodbye to this, this building, this property, Father God, for the last time. Father God, next, uh, next Sunday. Father, just 
Well, we just ask that you continue to pray, uh, prepare the way for us to move forward. And Father God, we show us how we can take this, take our, ourselves to another location and praise you in a mighty, mighty way. Father, we love you. Father, we ask that you just also go with us before us here today in fellowship as we have a, a fellowship offering here today, Father God, as we, as we have a meal. I'm asking that you just bless this, this food to our bodies and our bodies to better fulfill your service and complete your will in our lives. I ask this in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. All right, we love you guys. Stick around. Let's eat.